Good morning. If you would, uh, if you're able, please stand with me to hear the word of God. And with an open heart and open ears, hear the words. I'll be reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 17 through 23. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in a reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without a blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have a purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. And then from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces, their faces downcast. One of them, named Clopius, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to the sentence to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was one of those who was going to redeem Israel, and, and what went to the tomb early that morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it was just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter in his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all of the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as, as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, the day is almost over, so he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 for those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Greg. You know, I'm pretty sure that Jesus was with Walker as he ran across that stage because in my mama's mind, all I could picture was him wiping out and, whew, thank you, Jesus, right? <laughs> so we, we got a new game at the Carey house. We like to play games. We have family game night and movie night, and no, it's not all the time, but uh, we, we appreciate a good game every now and then. And so Kendall got a new game for her birthday in April, which it's actually been out for a while. It's called Googly Eyes. I don't know if you're familiar with Googly Eyes, but it's basically a, a glorified Pictionary. And so you have your little pad of paper and you have your pencil and you play on teams and, and you, you, know, you roll dice and then that determines what you have to draw for the other person to guess. But the challenge 
is that you don't get to just draw the picture and they guess. Instead, you get to wear these really cool glasses that um, blur your vision. And in fact, th these particular lenses make you cross-eyed. So you probably can't see my eyes, but if you could, they're going like this, I think, because I'm not really sure where my fingers are. But so not only is it a challenge to like figure out where your paper is, but then to put the pencil on the paper is a whole nother challenge. And, uh, you know, it's just dangerous to mess with vision, isn't it? I mean, it creates a whole new set of challenges when your vision gets messed with. And I grew up in a family with horrible vision. We discovered that my brother needed glasses when um, playing baseball one day. He caught the pop fly with his eye socket instead of his, his mitt. So he literally couldn't see what was in front of him. And as a result, um, my dad types everything. His handwriting is so poor because he went years and years and years as a child with poor eyesight and they didn't know it. And so his handwriting looks like chicken scratch. And I proudly have such poor depth perception that in driver's education, when we had to do the figure eight on the range, I managed to take down every center cone in that figure eight. You feel really safe with me on the road now, don't you? Yep. So, you know, vision is important to me. How we see things is important to me, and, and we just don't mess with vision and sight, because, you know, what we see and, and how we see it, they define our reality. You know, my reality with those crazy glasses on is that, well, I think the paper's here and I think the pencil's here, but in reality, I might be out here like this. And so when our vision is skewed, when it's off track, that means that our, our reality is skewed as well, and we may not even realize it at the time because we're so entrenched with just what we can see. And that's what our message is about today. So I challenged you last week, and I continue to challenge you this week to respond to the Easter story, maybe in a way that you have never responded to it before. And I challenge you to see Easter Sunday in every day, to, to celebrate the gift of Jesus and the resurrection in every day and in every way, to repent daily of those sins that create that barrier between you and God, because we don't like to admit it, but it's reality, and to fulfill the mission of the church, of this church, to love God to serve others, to grow in Christ, and to go live out our faith. You know, in, in doing that, we then fulfill the mission of the church with a big C. So that in 339 days, that's how long we have till Easter again, 339 days, in those days, when those days have passed and we celebrate Easter again, we can boldly proclaim how we have seen Jesus at work in our lives and in the lives of our friends and families and in our church and community. Wouldn't that be awesome if in 339 days we could all gather here again and every single one of us say, I have a story to tell about this last year. And that's why I celebrate them not just on Easter Sunday, but every day. Maybe that should be our challenge. I heard it was a pretty good message. I don't know. But I'm also mindful that sometimes our circumstances make it really difficult to celebrate a risen Savior who feels so far removed from what our current situation is. And so I wonder today if you can relate to these two individuals that Jenny talked about and that Greg read about. These two disciples are followers of Jesus, one named Cleopas and the other one, we don't know the name of that person, although a lot of scholars think that he was probably actually traveling with his wife. Um, I like to think that way, but we don't actually know. But in any case, they're returning to Emmaus. They've been in Jerusalem. They were there for the Passover. They experienced the tragedy of the crucifixion. Um, they were there to, to see the burial, to hear about the burial, and to hear that the body is now missing from the tomb. And there's rumor that maybe some of the disciples saw an angel, but, you know, they're not, they're not really, really certain about this. And the, the scripture describes them as downcast. They're disheartened, and I, I imagine them, you know, walking along, and maybe their heads are kind of low, and their, their shoulders are hanging just a little bit. They're just so defeated from everything that they've experienced, and, and maybe their feet just kind of barely skim the ground, because physically they're feeling the weight of the grief that their hearts are carrying. And as they walk, they're approached by a man, and we know that the man is Jesus, but Luke tells us that they were kept 
from recognizing him. So their eyes could see him. They saw this person and knew there was this person in front of them, but their hearts couldn't identify him for who he really was. They were kept from that. And he says, what, hey, what are you guys talking about? And I can just imagine Cleopas looking at him like, are you a buffoon? Where have you, where have you been? Have you been living in a rock? Well, as a matter of fact, for a few days, yes. Where have you been? Are you the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what's been going on? I mean, surely the, the rumor mill's been going, right? Everybody's been talking about this. And Jesus feigns ignorance, and so Cleopas fills him in, you know. Well, there was this guy, Jesus, and, and, and we had hope in him. I mean, he was a prophet, and he did amazing things. And, man, we were really hoping that he was the one who was going to save us, who was going to redeem Israel, but it just didn't happen. And now he's dead, and he was buried. And, and while we heard this crazy story, there were angels, and they say that he's risen, but I don't know, man. All of our hope. And it's clear that, that they're questioning everything that has happened. Everything they have experienced in the past three years of followers of Jesus have now been completely crushed in the past three days of his crucifixion and burial and maybe resurrection, but they're not really, really certain. And it's hitting them, the risks that they took to follow this prophet and their disappointment that he didn't bring with him this immediate earthly kingdom that they thought he was going to bring. He didn't fix their circumstances like they thought he was going to. And instead of putting his arms around them and saying, Oh, Cleopas, it's me. I love you. I'm here. That's not what he does. Instead, he uh, says, How foolish are you? How foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? In essence, he, he responds with the famous line that we all often use when advice we've given hasn't been heeded. Well, I told you so. Didn't you hear it? You know, he reminds them of all the scripture that prophesied the Messiah's birth, death, death. And resurrection. And I can imagine him going back to Genesis and saying, Didn't you hear in your studies that there was going to be a seed of Eve who would crush the serpent's head? And didn't you hear in all of the prophets about this Lord and Savior who was going to come of a virgin and be born and live and die and be buried and resurrected? Didn't you hear all of that? And he points out to them over and over and over again, all the times that the prophets pointed to him. All scripture that learned men, learned men, would have been taught from childhood. All things that these two disciples should have known. He wasn't sharing anything with them that they hadn't already heard before. Anything with them that they shouldn't have already known. And Luke goes on to tell us that Jesus accompanies them home, and, and as they prepare and share a meal, that Jesus takes the bread and, and he breaks it, and the disciples' eyes are opened. And in that moment, they recognize him just in time to see him vanish, just in time to see him disappear again. And they exclaim, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. These scriptures that we've already knew, but he opened them to us and we saw them in a new way, with a new heart, with a new set of eyes. Wouldn't it have been easier if God had just let them recognize him from the start? I mean, if nothing else, we'd have a couple fewer pages in our Bible, wouldn't be quite so thick and maybe intimidating, but that's not exactly the way that, that it worked. And we have to assume then that there's something that we're supposed to take from that, that there's some bigger lesson that we're supposed to be able to relate to. And so here's what I think. Take it for what it's worth. But I think that the story of Cleopas and, and his traveling companion, I think that's our story too. My story and, and your story. And a story of people who lived with hope of something bigger and something greater and, and belief in something greater than ourselves. And then those hopes were dashed. And this story of the road to Emmaus is a story of spiritual blindness, of the inability to see through a kingdom lens, 
not a physical blindness, but a blindness of the heart. And as writer and speaker Ann Voskamp, Mindy, you're going to love this, as Ann Voskamp puts it, spiritual amnesia. We suffer from it too, don't we? That spiritual blindness, that spiritual amnesia. Cleopas and his companion, they were prevented from recognizing Jesus because God needed to call out their spiritual blindness their inability or or maybe just their unwillingness to see Jesus as Messiah and Lord despite the predictions of the Old Testament, despite the word of the prophets that they knew so well, and despite what they with their own eyes had witnessed in Jerusalem, in one instant, with one challenge, a challenge that had been predicted beforehand, they questioned if he said who he, if he was who he said he was. So do you get that? Everything they witnessed, everything they knew, every piece of proof that they had that Jesus was Lord and Messiah, with one challenge, they doubted and they questioned. How often do we do the same? It doesn't take very much, does it, to make us question and doubt? How often do we forget in the challenges of today how God provided for us yesterday. And how often do we forget in the worries of today the freedom that he provided for us yesterday? And how often in the struggles of today do we forget how he carried us yesterday? You know, Scripture tells us that that when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are made new in him. The old is gone, the new is born. He lives in us, giving us a new heart, a new mind, a new set of eyes and ears that are in tune to hear his voice and to see his face and to see the world the way that he sees it. That's what we're talking about with that that kingdom lens. But I think we have a choice whether or not we tap into that. That's where our free will comes into play. We have a choice whether or not we choose to see ourselves and our church and our families and our community, our world, through that kingdom lens. We get to pick. And it's easy to make that choice on Easter Sunday when we sing hallelujah and everybody's on the same page. And it's easy to make that choice when things in our lives are going well, when things are falling into place the way that, let's be honest, we think that they should fall into place. But it's not so easy when our health is in crisis. And it's not so easy when our marriage is crumbling or our finances are in shambles or our children are disobedient or our friend betrays us or our job feels monotonous or the Sunday message just doesn't feed us. Or the waitress doesn't remember to fill our drinks the instant they're empty. Or another driver cuts us off. It's so easy in those moments to see things through the lens of our own mortal brokenness. And then to see them through the kingdom lens of God. So this message from Jesus to the travelers to Emmaus is the same message to us. Open your eyes. Remember how you experienced me before. And the promise that I won't leave you, I won't forsake you. You can trust me. You can trust that I'm here now because you saw me before. Jesus was right there in their midst, right beside them, but they couldn't see him because they were too focused on the heartache of the moment. They were too focused on how they felt about their circumstances to recognize that he was right there walking through those circumstances with them. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss Jesus. I don't know about you, but I believe that he is present in every moment of my life. And man, I don't want to miss him. And if I do, it's my fault. It's my failure to see, not his failure to show up. So how do we do it? How do we make sure that we don't miss him? That we walk through life with a kingdom lens instead of a broken lens. And for me, it goes back to our mission for the church. For me, it starts when I choose to love God, 
when I choose to place him before all other relationships, before all decisions that I have to make, when I choose to surrender to him and to walk in obedience to his plan for my life and not my plan for how I think my life should go. Because let's be honest, if we followed my plan, I don't think I would be here talking to you. Whether you see that as good or bad, that's your deal. But here I am. (laughs) And it starts when I choose to serve others. When I choose to look past my own comfort and convenience, past my own judgments and prejudices, and see the potential in all people as children of God who have a need that I can meet. And it starts when I choose to grow in Christ, when I choose to study his life and his teachings. And my heart burns like those travelers to Emmaus because I see who I'm supposed to be and how I'm supposed to live when I study him. And it starts when I choose to go out and live my faith. Because when I choose to represent Christ to the world through my interactions with others, it's his power in work at work, not my own power at work. And don't misunderstand me. Because I'm not saying that living out this mission promises no pain and no heartache. Because the reality is that if there were no pain, this wouldn't be a choice, right? If it promised smooth sailing and easy roads and no heartache, we would all be following Jesus and saying, yeah, sign me up for the easy way. It's not the easy way, it's the way. And you take with it what comes with it. It's easy to see God at work and to see Jesus in our midst when the blessings are obvious and abundant. So I want you to know that I hear you if your heart is crying out right now. I hear you if your current situation is so painful and you're just here because you don't know where else to go right now. And you're just hoping that there's going to be something here that's going to help you through whatever it is. I I hear your pain and I feel your pain because I've had pain. But I can tell you that in my pain, he always, always shows up. And, in fact, he was present before I ever even had eyes to see it. You know, when I was facing depression and an obsessive-compulsive disorder in my early 20s, he showed up in a counselor who coached me through and in strength to keep putting one foot in front of the other, and in Alex Carey, who loved me and continues to love me despite my imperfections and my continued battles. And when I sent my husband to war, God showed up in the presence of mind to take care of what needed to be taken care of financially and to continue teaching my kids at school. In the people who walked alongside me in a, in a support group, in the technology that allowed me to hear his voice and see his face, and in a little girl who gave me a reason to get up every morning. And when I cared for my mom through her cancer battle, God showed up in the energy to be a caregiver and a mother and a wife and a teacher all at the same time. And in an oncologist and nurses who not only cared for her but cared for me and said to me at the end of it all, you did such a good job taking care of her. And when I decided to leave a very stable, fulfilling teaching career, that was pretty much assured to me through retirement to pursue ministry of all things. God showed up. He showed up in taking care of the provision for a 50% pay cut and the uncertainty of having no experience whatsoever and no guarantee of anything beyond the next 12 months. And most powerfully, he showed up in you in the people of Hillside who have supported me and loved me and give me the privilege of walking through life with you. You see, he shows up, you guys, every time. And do you notice that most often he shows up in flesh and blood? We have reason to continue celebrating the Easter story. And it's because the tomb may be empty, but Jesus still walks. 
He walks this earth in you and in me. And it's all in how we choose to see our circumstances. And so I want to share one more story with you as we wrap up, and then we'll be done. Um, And this story wouldn't have been part of this message until this week. Some of your amazing children and youth leaders and I went to Atlanta this week. Got in at 2 o'clock Saturday morning. And um, we went to the Orange Conference. It was really, really inspiring. Great time. You know, you leave there just feeling like your head's ready to explode because you've heard all these amazing speakers and learned what people are doing in different churches and how they're reaching kids in their community. And the focus this year was on being a neighbor. You know, how do we not just love the people that are within our walls, but how do we go out and love those outside of the walls? And there was a speaker who challenged everyone there. He said, you know, what if every time you go through Starbucks or you check out at Walmart or you um, eat at Bob Evans or any time you receive a service of any kind, what would happen if before you leave you ask the person who served you, is there anything I can pray for you? You know, in our, in our minds, we're all thinking, oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. We should totally do that. And in your heart, you're thinking, oh, that's scary. <laughs> and he had some stories to share about the impact that had made and all of that stuff. And so we left um, that evening, and we stopped some, I don't know where we were. We stopped somewhere, and we ate at a buffet, And, you know, going to a buffet is kind of like going to Walmart. I mean, you see every demographic of the area that you could possibly witness. And it was noisy. It was loud. There were kids running everywhere. There was food all over the place. And and we got ushered to this back room. We joked that it was the kids' room, and that was very appropriate for us to be back there in this back room. And I think there were a couple of people serving back there. And and, uh, we met Trina. I don't know anything about Trina. But Trina was our waitress, and she brought our drinks and everything, and, and um, we were sitting there about finished with our meal, and a couple of the others, had, they were up doing something, and, and I said to Jenny and to Sarah Cruz, I said, all right, I mean, here we go, proof of the pudding. Are we going to do this? Are we going to do this? Are we going to ask Trina if there's anything we can pray for her? And, and we're like, yeah, yeah, and I said, okay, who's brave enough to do it? Because I wasn't really feeling it, and Jenny said, I will. I'll ask her. And so Trina comes over, and she's picking up plates, and and Jenny, I loved getting to watch this. I mean, you have no idea what a blessing this was to me to watch this. And and Jenny said, Trina, how are you doing? And Trina stopped, and she said, is it written all over my face? And we were kind of like, no. And, And Jenny said, well, I mean, is there something that we can pray for you, Trina? And she stood there for a minute, and her eyes started to well with tears. And she said, yes. Can you just, can you just pray for my anxiety and my worries? And can you, just, can you just pray for my finances? Because I know God's got this, and I know I've got to trust him, but it's just so hard. And I know God's word tells me about the sparrow, and that if God loves the sparrow, he loves me more. And I know this, but it's so hard when you're trying to do this on your own. And Jenny said, well, We'll pray for you. And, and that, was, that was it. And we're all just sitting there like, did this really just happen? And she's picking up plates, and she, I mean, she's crying. And then we feel kind of bad because we're like, we just made her cry at her workplace. You know, is she going to get in trouble? And, and so we're still sitting there eat, finishing up our meal, and the other two come back, and we're kind of filling them in, and we're like, all right, you know, it, it's time to pay. we got to leave Trina a tip. What are you going to do? when you just asked a woman if you can pray for her, and one thing she mentions is her finances. So I don't tell you this as a pat on the back, but the response was the tip was more generous than what it would have been otherwise. And as we were leaving, I said, you know, what if somebody just comes by and swipes that, that tip? And so Jenny said, I'll take it to her. And so she took the money, and, and I had already left, but I heard about this. Uh, I kind of beelined out of there. But um, Jenny said she took the tip over to her, and handed it to her, and they hugged each other, and Jenny said, God sees you, and Trina said, God sent you. You can't make that up, people. You can't make that up. And it started with one question. 
open the eyes of your heart. Jesus is with you in your circumstances today. And Jesus is expressed through you in the circumstances of somebody else. God sees you. And God sent you. What are we going to do with that?